Good evening. Hello. Welcome to another episode of the, uh, the Liquid Antiquarian, which is a channel with myself, Arthur Motley, and Dave Broom. Uh, I'm a whiskey retailer by trade or a spirits retailer. Dave's a, a spirits writer of some repute. And uh, <laughs> this, this channel uh, aims to explore a little bit of history um, with an amateurish enthusiasm by looking at old objects, documents, trinkets, ephemera, uh, which Dave and I have collected over the years and shared. And we hope to pull these together to tell some interesting and different stories about the past, not as pro professional historians, but as um, really enthusiastic amateurs. Although already in these eight or nine episodes, we've been amazed at what we've discovered and um, and some of the yeah some of the interesting new looks we've had at certain <laughs> subjects, and I think this one, uh, how Scotland became Scotchland up your kilt, is going to <laughs> tie it all up with a nice tartan ribbon, um, <laughs> and bring a few themes uh, together, uh, which is great. Um, and well, we always drink, we always have a drink as we go along. And I should mm -hmm. introduce what we're drinking. Yeah. So we are drinking a Belechen, which is uh, from a distillery called Edra Dower in Pitlochry, or just outside Pitlochry, where um, we actually have a shop called Drinkmonger. And it's a little gateway, it's a little portal to the plaid. It's this. This, uh, this small town about a bladder's distance from Edinburgh as uh, people drive up north to visit the Highlands. And it is one of these gateways to the Highlands. Um, and you do see a bit of tartan there in a, in a, a few of these. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, exactly. But it's a lovely wee place. Um, and we thought it was appropriate uh, whiskey to have. Belekin is the, the, the peated expression uh, from... Pitlochry, but we also chose from Edradour rather, but we also chose this one because, well, some, we've had a few sponsors here. We've had um, a kindly a few brands uh, offer patronage to our to our little um, adventures, but this one we're actually supporting. We, I've bought this bottle. We've opened this bottle because um, we wanted to support the independent whiskey bars of Scotland, or just a little mention to the licence trade generally in Scotland. We're talking about tourism in Scotland. We're talking about the vision of, of Scotland and whiskey and how they interact tonight. Um, and some of these places are kind of a part of a modern expression of that. So the Independent Whiskey Bars of Scotland, it's a little group of uh, great independent bars. Um, and they choose, along with a chap called Angus McRail, the spongiest of whiskey experts, <laughs> um, exceptional cast a bottle and then they're shared amongst them so they have something really interesting and a very high quality that you can only get on their bars uh, i've just got a little slide of some of these chaps because these are some of the people in the licensed trade who are going to need going to need your help soon when you can go back to the pub of all the people who've had a rough time in a commercial sense uh, the licensed trade have had it pretty tough they've had a very very rough ride so um these are the 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 cartel of the independent whiskey bars of scotland and there are some superb places i'm sure you know most of these people tatsuya minugawa of the highlander inn of craig eleki uh, one of the most amazing whiskey personalities in scotland in the world and we've got paul of the bon accord in glasgow we've got john beach pretty inimitable mm. Um, <laughs> of Drum the Drocket. We've got the Thompson Brothers of Dornoch. Um, we've got Derek at the Artisan in Wishaw. Uh, we've got the guys, Matt McPherson and team up at the Malt Room in Inverness in the middle there. And then uh, we've got Marion down at the Ard Shield in Campbelltown. So if you live in, near any of these places, go along and have a dram soon. We've had it tough. They're going, to, they're going to welcome you, I'm sure, with open arms. And they've got loads of amazing whiskey that needs drunk. <laughs> Beautifully put. Beautiful. So, uh, to those guys, this is a raise a little Yeah, slide Good luck, guys. Yeah. And not just those ones, but, um, yeah, all, all, all people of the licensed trade. Delicious, but I think really good. It's really good. It's got that. Mm, it's a cracking drum. It really is. 
PT minerality. Mm. It's medicinal as well. Really, mm. really medicinal. Precise. I love it. I think Black and starting to show yep. really, really yeah. well now. Yeah, I've had um, a few crackers recently, actually. But... Yep, great spirit. Great spirit. Great company. So, Dave? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. We've got to do something, haven't we, Arthur? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, tonight, uh, I was kind of wanting to yeah, pull some things together in, in perhaps what seems to be a, a slightly uh, oblique fashion. Uh, so, after the jaw-dropping revelations uh, of the past couple of weeks about mixed match bills, and, you know, defrauding uh, you know, the government and the excise and everything. Uh, this is kind of, seems to be kind of taking a step back and, and looking at a kind of wider picture, but it's almost like uh, the clearances part, part two. So the clearances and improvements part two. This is what was underpinning a lot of the thinking that went on behind, behind the clearances. Because I think it's really important to to emphasise that whiskey's history is Scotland's history, or Scotch whiskey's history is Scotland's history, uh, and we perhaps tend to forget that. You know, we, we look at it purely in this very narrow narrow band of it being just about the drink and just about the industry and the company and the excise reports, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's not. There's a much bigger picture, uh, which is always going to be influencing the way the way that people drink. Uh, what they are drinking, how that drink is not just made, but how it's sold, uh, how it's marketed, and how Scotland is marketed. So that's kind of what we're doing. So it's a kind of a frolic uh, through cartoons and kilts and stags. And I, I, you actually asked me early on, Arthur, to, you know, uh, why don't why don't I wear a kilt? I, I don't actually have a kilt. In fact, in fact, I, I'd. I went around the house. I don't have a single piece of tartan in, the, in this house, uh, apart from this shirt, probably. I, I don't know if that counts, whether that's tartan or not. Well, it came with the suggestion of whether or not I should dress up like a Morris dancer. Yeah, so. I, I, I still think you should have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, you know, the, the time frame that we're, we're going to be talking about is kind of post-1745, so post Culloden, up, roughly speaking, to Edwardian times, so the early 20th century. You know that really important element uh, in in whiskey history, and also what well, the, the birth of the modern Scotland in, in in many ways as well. So, with 1745, at the end of the the Jacobite Rebellion, the defeat at Culloden, you see the ending of the clan system, the ending of the Jacobite cause, uh, and also as a result of the whole rebellion, Scots, and specifically, it's not really Scots, but it is specifically Highlanders are not popular. Uh, Highlanders are castigated and lampooned and considered to be idiotic, stupid people. You know, let's, they, they are the enemy uh, and they've also lost, therefore uh, let's lampoon them in, in cartoons and, you know, uh, denigrate uh, their culture, etc., etc. The normal propaganda, sadly speaking, but normal propaganda. And you see this character, Sonny, uh, appearing, not Sonny being the, the the famous uh, cannibal of Galloway, uh, but th this character called Sonny. And he here's Sonny on, on the left-hand side. Well, on both of them, but the one on the left-hand side uh, is, is the oldest one, which comes out in 1745. So this is a cartoon uh, in 1745, so uh, during or immediately after the Jacobite Rebellion. Uh, here is a, a Highlander in Tartan with his claymore, wearing his blue bonnet, uh, not knowing how to use a modern latrine. You know, that's how stupid the Highland Scotsman was. Sonny in the bog house. He's and getting it very wrong as well. He's, he's getting, getting it, it he's, <laughs> he really is getting it substantially wrong. Uh, uh, and I, I, the thing that fascinates me about this particular ca cartoon is the way that it reappears for the next 100 years. You, you, there's print after print after print. You go to the, the British Library uh, and it's reappearing by different artists and some really crudely done, uh, you know, in, in terms of draftsmanship. Uh, and and the, here's one, the, the one on the right hand side, 18, well, what is it, 1851? Uh, and there you have exactly the same image uh, of, of Sony uh, unable to, to work out how to use the toilet. If anything, so, even better, the one on the right is, or worse, depending on. Yes. Yes. Well, it, it depends if you're Scottish or English, I suppose, Arthur, you know. Uh, but but, but there, there we are, you know. And, and I think that the way in which 
the Sony character has continued because uh, we're going to see him. He's going to reappear uh, to, to, towards the, the, the end of our, our talk. So that is the image of, of, of the Highlander. And, you know, and I, I think there's another caricature and another cartoon that, that, which I think kind of sums up. And that, that, you know, when I first came across this, I thought, well, that's obviously, you know, late 19th century, early 20th century. It's not. It's, you know, 1797. Uh, you know, the two skinny shanked mean uh, Scotsmen with their tartan and their blue bonnets and lack of teeth and bad haircuts, you know, uh, standing there kind of moaning about stuff. The Scottish stereotype, the Scottish archetype uh, is there uh, in the 18th century, in this kind of, in, initially in this kind of post Culloden uh, era. So the whole thing is, uh, <sighs> about how Scotland's image is then changed and begins to shift and begins to alter to become this ideal of beauty, uh, which allows whiskey to be sold uh, around the world. The Highland line, uh, we, we know it in terms of whiskey as being a taxation line, uh, but it's also a geological line, but it's also a cultural line uh, and everything. So everything above the Highland line was considered. And if you look at the, the, the traveler's accounts in the 18th century, uh, it's bleak, it's a desert, uh, it is primitive, the people are primitive. Uh, Patrick Seller, you know, the, 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 the infamous uh, factor of, of the, the Duke of Sutherland's and Duchess of Sutherland's estates uh, up there, describing uh, the, the, the farmers uh, that, that he was clearing off the land as aborigines, you know, uh, speaking this crude language. You know, the, the, there, was a, uh, there was a cultural program uh, underway because improvement wasn't just about agriculture. It was a it was a project to change and civilize uh, and improve, therefore, people as well. Uh, and it, it was about tapping into the potential of the land and maybe tapping into the potential of the people. But this improvement could only come from outsiders, and that those outsiders could be from the lowlands. I'm not saying it was all English. Uh, could only come from from outsiders from the lowlands and their betters, uh, and this is kind of the undercurrent going on that this transformation of the highlands from this bleak desert uh, occupied by Aborigines uh, into something which uh, becomes I an idealised landscape. Uh, so, one way in which this starts off is through the army. 1757, so not that long after Culloden, Highland regiments uh, are beginning to, to be formed uh, by, by the landowners under the, under the direction of Pitt the Elder. I've always wanted to quote Pitt the Elder, so I'm going to quote Pitt the Elder. Uh, and this is what he said, you know, about success of raising Highland uh, regiments. I sought for merit, wherever it was to be found, and it is my boast that I was the first minister who looked for it and found it in the mountains of the north. I called it forth and drew into your service a hardy and intrepid race of men. Highlanders were now useful. Highlanders were now cannon fodder. They were scary fighters. They were the Highland warriors but they were our scary fighters, you know. Uh, and one theory is that this kind of loss of generations of young men also kind of dampened down any potential internal insurrection that went on in Scotland because they're fighting overseas for the British Empire. And one of the ways to get out of being a, a Jacobite was to move abroad. We've seen that in the number of, of Scots and landowners who moved over to the Caribbean to enslave plantations. Uh, but also also moving to India uh, as, as, so you've got officers of the army, but you've also got administrators, you've got middle management. The East India Company becomes, uh, and the quote was, and after 1750, a veritable Scottish fiefdom. And you see this, this building up of, of little pockets of expat communities in India and across in the Caribbean and eventually over uh, in Australia for different reasons, so that's mainly due to clearances. Uh, and also, one reason to stick together is the fear of Sony, because, you know, the English didn't necessarily like them. There's still going to be this friction. So the Scots are staying together. They're moving across. Uh, they're, the, the Highlands are changing. The idea of the Highlands are changing because of Highland regiments. 
And the Highland regiments are exempted from that ban on tartan. This is important. We'll pick up on that one uh, later on. And as a result of this, really by the tail end of the, the 18th century, what you're beginning to see is the Highland hero beginning, be, be, beginning to emerge. So Sonny is suddenly being challenged by this tartan-clad neoclassical warrior. Uh, and here we have two fantastic examples. One from very early in the, the 18th century on the left-hand side, which was uh, William Cumming. It was a piper to the Laird of Grant. It's an amazing, amazing portrait. Uh, mm. So that, that's pre-1715 uh, you know, uh, rebellion. Uh, and then on, on the, on the right-hand side there, we have Colonel William Gordon uh, of Fivey. And this is in 1766. This is painted on his grand tour of, of Europe. Uh, so he's wearing his, his kilt, uh, almost like a Roman toga. Uh, and here you have the elevation of the Scots landowner to um, heroic status. A substantial and significant shift. Yes, he was Hanoverian. No, he wasn't a Jacobite, I know. But he was wearing tartan. So suddenly you begin to see the shift uh, uh, taking place. Uh, he, he was the uncle to the Duke of Gordon, who we're going to see uh, later. Uh, and, and like all sort of great Scottish landowners, he lived in Berkshire. Uh, but anyway, uh, we'll, 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 we'll plus all of that. Is, it, is that the, the Glen of Reading? <laughs> Yeah, yes, but I mean, it's an extraordinary portrait. I, 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 I do, I do absolutely love it. I love, I love that portrait. And yeah, see, it's, it's, so, so you've seen that shift taking place, you know. It's got all the classical references as well, even mm. before you look at the, you know, the, the Colosseum in the background, that sublime kind of noble thing. Yeah, and, and the sublime, a, a beautiful cue, because we're going to be talking about sublime as a philosophical mm. construct. Uh, as I believe uh, you're meant to call it, uh, in a minute or two, because by 1760, so again, really not that long after Culloden, you're, you begin to see the shift in thinking or a shift in our portrayal of what the Highlands were all about. And this is coming through Romanticism, the beginnings of Romanticism, the, the Romantic era. And enter James McPherson and enter, enter Ossian, uh, the poems of Ossian. So James McPherson was from Badnoch. Uh, he wrote in 1760, uh, this book appeared called Fragments of Ancient Poetry Collected in the Highlands of Scotland, which were then followed by two volumes of the poems of Ossian, which McPherson claimed were translations uh, of rediscovered works of an ancient Gallic bard called Ossian, who wrote down the ancient and archaic history of Scotland. Ossian is an absolute phenomenon. Uh, it is translated all around Europe. It, it becomes uh, the most uh, read book in, in Europe. You know, so this is it, it's an absolute phenomenon that, 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 that begins to take place and it fundamentally shifts the thinking about Scotland, uh, about what Scotland is. The problem about Ossian is that Macpherson, there was no bard called Ossian. You know, Macpherson didn't kind of find these in a cave. You know, Macpherson did speak Gaelic. Macpherson did gather together Gaelic texts, but he worked it to suit his own ends. Uh, and if you compare his reworkings of those old Gaelic texts and then his, you know, fantasy creation of this essentially creation myth of Scotland uh, with actual Gaelic poetry of the time, you, you'll see it's completely different. You know, Gaelic poetry of the time is all bright and it's about a fertile land and it's filled with life. It's filled with nature. It's filled with deer, flowers, burns, etc. Yes, there are heroes, but there, there are praise songs to heroes uh, and, and chiefs, etc., etc. So it's a completely different thing. You know, you look at Gaelic poetry and you think this is a, a vibrant literary and that oral, oral culture going on. And if you read Ossian, which I urge you not to do, uh, it's, 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 it's utterly dreary. You know, and it is dreary and the language is dreary and the landscape is dreary. It's misty. It's melancholic. It's sad. It is haunted. You know, it, it's, it's, you know it's all about the past, you know. 
<laughs> and it's incredibly repetitive as well. Oh, it's insanely repetitive. You know, <laughs> I had a little know. go. I had a little yeah. go. <laughs> you know, but you know, he, he was using actual text. You know, so if you'd really taken the time to to read a book such as the Red Book of Clan Ranald, which we have a little little, little slide of, you know, uh, this this was one of the texts that he he referred to and kind of ripped off. Uh, you know, which is an amazing looking piece of work. Would you like me to read an extract of that? Uh, sorry, that, that's the reason I paused. It wasn't because I was under wee drab. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, I, 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 after you, Dave. After oh, you. <laughs> I, actually, yeah. My Gallic, my Gallic is, isn't that good. It's amazing, it's, isn't it? It's yeah. runic. It's, it, yeah. it's Tolkien-esque. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's like Tolkien. It's amazing. Yeah. It's, it's, it's incredible. But, but the whole thing about it is that it's recasting the Highlands. It, Ossian isn't dangerous, you know. Ossian isn't a Jacobite. Ossian is in the past, He's, and he himself is also writing about the end of an era. Uh, but the transformation of the Highlands is now that desert is now romantic. It's now natural. The occupants are now children of Ossian. They are noble savages. Mm. What Macpherson does is kind of create this alternative history. He creates a national myth. He what was described as now Scotland's. Homer, or Ossian is described as Scotland's Homer. So this idea of the new Scotland is, is kind of born at this point and it reaches kind of apotheosis about 100 years, about 100 years later with Queen Victoria. Uh, but, you know, and maybe, maybe this is allowed to happen because part of the whole improvement thing is about systematic dismantling of Gallic culture. You know, the, the old Gallic culture and the old way of looking at Gallic culture was Sony you know, and Aborigines and these people, these primitive people who spoke this rude tongue, uh, versus this new interpretation of it, which is Ossian, this kind of decayed, ancient, heroic landscape. Uh, so a, a complete shift uh, that, that, that's taking place uh, within within the books of Ossian. It straight away makes me think of modern parallels, which maybe it's not backed up by the shift coming from literature, but maybe the way that modern people, or sorry, People who live in the Western world almost look at Africa now. Mm. That there's there's a, a noble wisdom, a, mm. a, 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 a simple knowledge, something that we have lost, um, a purity almost to how you see the, the the simplicity of their life without the complexity and the stress of modern life, compared to how well, thankfully, few people see them now as savages. But 150 years ago, they would have done. Yeah, and, and yeah, no, I, I agree absolutely, hundred percent. And it's also this idea of it being safe. You know, the, this idea that it's, you know, the whole thing about Ossian is it's not political. It's not. It's Ossian is very carefully written not to try and inflame people to start another Jacobite rebellion. You know, it's about it's about civilization, which is at the at its end. You know, Ossian is kind of the last of the bards. You know, Ossian is you know the elves are leaving Middle Earth. You know, you know kind of thing. You know, so it's it's. You know, the, the, the end of something. So therefore it's safe. And this idea of safety, uh, and the, which goes with the kind of sanitization that took, took place of, of Scotland and Scotland's history is, is a really important point. And yes, you're exact, exactly, you know, n nobody, you know, unless you study African history, you don't learn about the great empires of, of Africa. You don't learn about the incredible culture in Mali, for example, or Ethiopia. You know, yeah, Benin, um, you know, Benin, you know, Benin, Benin yes, yeah, yeah, in yeah. the news a lot at the moment. But yeah. um, McPherson was was that intentional? Was it he he wrote this because he wanted to, and that was a net effect of it? Or yeah, you know, McPherson. Yes, I, I I think he did. You know, I I think this is all part of the, this kind of this move towards improvement. You know, the, the, this move towards trying to write an alternative history of Scotland. So there is an element of national pride, you know, and, and in the heart of it, I, I believe, that, that there is probably good intent, you know, and I, I think one of the positives that, that comes out of Ossian, you know, although it was denigrated ultimately at the beginning of the, the 19th century by Walter Scott and, you know, the, there were there were committees and, and commissions about disproving, you know, the, the, the facts about Ossian. But one, one of the things it did was actually stimulate antiquarians to begin to look at Gallic texts and help to preserve them. So, so something positive came out of Ossian, even though it was a fake or, or a forgery or a reworking in, 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 in some way, a remix. 
and I, I think something something positive I, I actually began to come out of it. But 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 you, you mentioned the, the word sublime uh, earlier on, and this is very much kind of what McPherson is working on. So he's working on the, the ideas which were propounded by by Edmund Burke uh, in 1757 in his his book, A Philosophical Inquiry on, into the Origin of our ideas of sublime and beautiful, uh, which I'm sure all of you have read. Uh, actually, you should. It, it, it's a really, really interesting book. Uh, and a fundamental, a really, really important uh, uh, text for, for the Romantic period. Uh, and so within it, basically, it, it, I, I'll read you a quote. There's a quote coming up here. Uh, so th the passion caused by the great and the sublime in nature when those causes operate most powerfully, is astonishment. The astonishment is that state of the soul in which all its motions are suspended with some degree of horror. So the sublime is not beautiful. Beautiful is comfortable. The sublime gets the hairs rising on the back of your neck and on your arms. So the sublime is about the impressive, the awe-inspiring, the terrifying. It's speaking about vastness and power and infinity uh, because those are kind of that moment of danger that you feel yourself at is actually uh, the most intense, uh, you know, feeling that you, you, you're going to be having. It, it kind of goes beyond the rational and it's this kind of instant atavistic response. Uh, yeah. A lot of the art, you get the, the, the pictures, you get these towering cliffs or towering glens yeah. or a little waterfall but then these dark landscapes around it that yeah. make you feel insignificant yeah. yeah exactly you know you know darkness you know you know waterfalls cliffs uh sea storms thunder you know vast horizons you know and you think about the highlands you know they are terrifying they're awesome they're fraught with danger uh and and also hey now they're empty as well, you know, and, and, and yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, that, that feeling of insignificance, you know, standing there dwarfed by, by the magnificence and alien quality of, of the landscape, the sublime. Uh, you know, I, having emptied the land, you know, I actually kind of, kind of helped with, with, with all of this. But, you know, you've got that shift that takes place from being the desert uh, into something which... The landscape hasn't changed, but the people's views of the landscape has, has shifted, and it becomes a positive, you know, rather than a, rather than a negative. Uh, and so, so we move on to we will talk about whiskey, I suppose, at some point. Uh, we move on to Walter Scott uh, at the beginning of the nineteenth century. Walter Scott, extraordinary, extraordinary man. You know, nobody really talks about Walter Scott uh, anymore. Nobody really reads his books uh, anymore probably apart from Charlie McLean. Uh, and, you know, and, and they are pretty long and they're pretty turgid. Uh, but think about this. You know, it's really hard to comprehend how significant he was uh, across Europe, you know, like Ossian, across Europe, books translated into all the European languages, 26 novels, that's 40 volumes, oh, copious other writings, poetry, biography of Napoleon, etc., etc all written in a period of 17 years. I mean, it's unbelievable what, what, what this man did. Global, global reach. But here's a quote from the Lady of the Lake. Uh, I won't read it all. Uh, the western waves of ebbing day rolled o'er the glen their level way. Each purple peak, each flinty spire was bathed in floods of living fire. But not a setting beam could glow within that dark, within the dark ravines below where twined the path and shadow hid. Round many a rocky pyramid, shooting abruptly from the dell, its thunder splintered pinnacle round many an insulated mass. The native bulwarks of the pass, huge as a tower which builders vain, presumptuous piled on Shinar's plain. The rocky summits, split and rent, form turret, dome, or battlement, or seemed fantastically set with cupola or minaret. Boom. The Bravo. The Lady of the Lake. Now, there you have the sublime. You know, there you have romantic poetry, the sublime, terrifying and somehow beautiful at the same time. Lady of the Lake is published in 1810. It sells 20,000 copies in a year. <laughs> wow. As a result, mass tourism. 
the yeah. first example of mass tourism in Scotland. Thanks to the Lady of the Lake, everybody's up to the Trossachs. Everybody goes up to, to Loch Catron uh, to gaze at the sublime vistas. Uh, the project, Scott's project, uh, is is beginning. And, you know, my first trip, uh, primary school trip, <laughs> was was Loch Catron, was, and to go on the Lady of the Lake, which is a wee steamer, which went up and down the lake while the captain pointed out things of interest on the banks to seven-year-old kids going, look, there's Benvenue, and, you know. <laughs> you know behold, ben, behold, a thunder-splintered <laughs> pinnacle. <laughs> Exactly. You know, it's so little. It is a good, that is a good line. That is it, a good line. He wrote very, very good lines, you know. And, and Scott's using the historical novel to kind of reframe Scotland. Mm. You know, so it's... The historical novel, again, is safe. It's in the past. Therefore, it's not threatening. There's nothing... It's, Scott's a unionist. You know, Scott is British. He wants to have Scottish identity, but he wants to be British at the same time. So he wants to be a loyal subject. He wants to, he believes in the union. He believes in having your own identity. Uh, but he is writing, essentially, the new history, as Macpherson had written the new history, because Victor's right the history. And now the, the next thing that Scott wants to do is get a royal seal of approval for all of this, for all of this, this project, this, this redressing of the balance. You know, we're nice guys. Honestly, we're really interesting guys. We've got an amazing country. So he stage manages, uh, choreographs, basically, the state visit of George IV in 1822, the Royal Jaunt, as it becomes known. It takes two years to plan. Uh, the, the, the letter that he sends out, which sadly I, I, I wasn't meant to get, get an original copy of, uh, very, very detailed about what you do and also, how, you know, uh, how ladies are to curtsy, how they're to greet the king, what the king's going to do. You know, it, it's you know, it's it's a PR person with a clipboard essentially going, okay, right, at, at twelve fifteen, uh, this is going to happen, and the king is going to go take three steps to the left and five steps to the right, and he tells all the Highland chiefs to turn up in Tartan. Really, really important uh, thing, mm. and if mm. they have followers, they have to wear tartan as well, and everybody in Edinburgh should be wearing. A, a blue and white cockade. But suddenly, Jacobitism is beginning to get reabsorbed into the mainstream. And, and then, of course, this is whiskey. People who know their whiskey history, this is one of the markers, the classic markers yeah, of what yeah. you learn about whiskey is mm. King George IV coming to Edinburgh, being greeted off the boat with a glass of Glenlivet, yeah. um, Elizabeth of Rothy Mercus. Um, Yes. Uh, is 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 told to go down to the cellar and find something mild as milk or whatever it is, yeah. and uh, and yeah, no, this, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Well, it it yeah. is a bit weird. I mean, it I, is, yeah. of, the... I often I, I often mention this, you know, in tastings how 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 symbolic of how endemic illicit distillation mm -hmm. is and how drunk it is by the the very person at the pinnacle. At the thunder splintered pinnacle of the tax <laughs> uh, uh, of the tax system um, is even commanding uh, yeah. or asking for an illicit whiskey, or whether it was his choice or Walter. Well, yeah, yeah, this is my point. I, I don't think George the Fourth actually said, "You know what, Watty? I really fancy a dram." Get yeah. I I think he was told to ask for this. You know, I, there's there's a lot of PR about this. He was in Ireland the year before. And in his speech to, uh, to the, the people of Ireland, he said, "I will, I, I will raise a glass of Irish whiskey punch to all of you." You know, this is all, this is all part of the whole, you know, the, the flummery era. You know, the, there's yeah. a lot of, you know, there's a lot of spin going on. You know, uh, it, it, you know, the, the, this is not this is not new. But Obama it, drank Guinness yeah. as well. Obama yeah. drank it beautifully, beautifully yeah. when he went over. <laughs> But you know, it kind of works both ways because Scott Walter Scott wants Scotland to to become part of the union and actually show itself. You know, it's civilized. There's been Scottish Enlightenment. There's all of that. You know, so really kind of bringing Scotland together and actually showing a new new facet of Scotland and creating a new facet or, or or way in which people can talk about Scotland and understand Scotland. And also, the king is deeply deeply unpopular, uh, and he's trying to make peace with Ireland, trying to make peace with Scotland. Because this is the first royal visit for, I think, what was 150 years, official royal, royal, royal visit for 150 years. Uh, 
you know, so he's you know trying to. It's a bit PR kind of kind of, kind of going going on there. Uh, thank you, Ian, for that. Uh, you know, so the way that George and and Walter uh, and Wattie Scott saw the whole thing was like this. You know, the kilt, you know, made to measure. Uh, you know, they, they got the measurements. Scott got it run up. Here's the portrait of King George the Fourth. David Wilkie looking very bold, looking like a, a huge, huge Highland hero. And this is how the cartoonists of London saw him. <laughs> 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 you know, uh, the whole thing was, was it a success? Uh, yes, it was a success, I think, uh, in some ways. It was also wow. an absolute PR disaster. <laughs> well, yeah. hundreds of thousands of people turned out. Is, yes. it, is that right? Yeah. It's fair yeah. to say. And mm. and King George is yeah. King George is the one on the left, is he? Yes, yeah, he he is. I mean, looking, I mean, compared to the other guys, uh, he's looking remarkably, remarkably well drawn. You know, the, the kilt's very short, muscular, muscular thighs. I would yeah, say thighs and thighs of a cart horse. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know, socks could be a wee bit longer, but you know, yeah. he's he's looking he's looking good now. You know, if you go on. Uh, to our to our next one, yeah. <laughs> you know, here he is. Here he is capering uh, with uh, with the ladies uh, at, at the ball. I, I mean, I I can't help but being drawn to a his his vast girth and also that that pendulous sporran uh, dangling dangerously down. Yes, uh, just you know, you know, classic early nineteenth century cartoon. Uh, it's, and it's it's a classic. And his quote, I, I see. I feel I can do this because even though it's got a bit of Scots in there, I think it's probably, probably in in, in an well, English it, accent. It's fine. A German accent, if you want. Yeah. I, I no, I'm not going to do that. Um, <laughs> I could do it muckle easier if we were in Midlothian. I don't know what that means, but um. <laughs> yeah. So you know, it, it's yeah, it's. It's a success. It's a failure. It's lampooned. It, you know, it kind of works. You know, I think we got probably one more there, which is actually even, even, I think, even more absurd. Uh, yeah. You know, the, the kilt is riding up even higher. But you know, the muscular, <laughs> the muscular thighs, are, the muscular thighs are there. Uh, but also, Sony is still there. So it's, the whole project hasn't fully worked because around about the same time, you, you get this cartoon coming uh, coming out, which again is got. You know, there's a lot of kind of political stuff in there which I don't actually fully understand. It's, it's some bill that hasn't hasn't been passed. But there again, you've got Sony, you've got you've got the bonnet, you've got the kilt, you've got the kind of pinched face, uh, the 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 kind of mean visage, the the miserableness, the weeping, uh, the picking at, at what looks like an empty snuff horn. You know, yeah. so the, so there's still that kind of uh, mean mean spirited, skinny shanked. Uh, Scottish stereotype uh, underway there. But in terms of the long term, if that kind of makes sense, uh, Scott's project kind of win, wins out uh, and the landowners buy into it. Uh, and, and this is the important thing. This is where it kind of links very beautifully with, with, with the whole uh, clearance thing and, and improvements. It's driven by the landowners. And the landowners are buying into this fact that they are now Scottish. But this the Scottishness that they are portraying is fundamentally different to to what what it was when the clan system was was underway although the clan system had undoubtedly huge huge problems so uh here we have uh the cock of the north in, in you can yeah what a cock you know <laughs> but it, uh, it's, a, it's a great picture that it's, it's an amazing portrait it's a beautiful beautiful uh portrait by lucas uh and this is the duke of gordon you know the Duke of Gordon, you know, the, the 1823 Act, who actually had nothing to do with the 1823 Act. But anyway, the Duke of Gordon, the Whiskey Duke of Gordon, uh, there he is, the Cock of the North. Uh, so a, a very, very famous, famous uh, picture. And famous in whiskey terms because he is said to have lobbied Parliament to a degree uh, to do with the 1823 Act. He was the landowner where George Smith had Glen Is it mm. same Duke of Gordon, yeah? Exactly the same Duke of Gordon. Yep, yeah, yeah. So, so there we have it. Because, you know, uh, just before we move on, I did yeah. a little detail there of that that fine sporran with the badger 
it, it brought to mind a certain Charlie McLean again. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And again, probably I don't know if he had roadkill in those days. He probably shot it rather <laughs> around the rather than the roadkill that Charlie wears around here, around these midriff. But uh, but it's not no. a badger. What is it? An otter? No, um, nobody quite knows what it is. Really, <laughs> one of its eyes is hanging out. Anyway. It's a, at least I think it's one of his eyes. He's got a hole to be killed. You know? Anyway, uh, moving on. Uh, uh, because you know, we've not really talked about whiskey. And I, you know, I'm sorry. You know, I'm, I'm sorry about this. Uh, but this is everything to do with whiskey. So, so mm -hmm. this is kind of the, the, the preamble. It's a long preamble. Uh, it's taken about half the time. But it's a long preamble because what we've examined so far in in all of all of the episodes about Scotch whiskey is how the modern whiskey industry came into being. This is about what it came out of. This is about what is sitting behind that, which, which is part of the motivation for the modern whiskey whis, whiskey industry and the way in which it evolved. So this is fundamental to to the way people were thinking about whiskey and the success with with, with which which whiskey had. Sorry, uh, Belekin, My goodness. Uh, and you know, so whiskey comes out of this Highland and Gallic tradition, but it replaces it. The modern whiskey industry kind of sweeps that away and it replaces it completely. Uh, and all of the images which are now beginning to swirl around Scotland, this idea of this new Scotland, begin to become kind of co-opted into the way in which whiskey can be talked about and the way that whiskey can be sold, really from about the 1860s onwards. You know, Scotland's becoming a new country and whiskey is part of this new country. Uh, and one way in, in which you can begin to see the way in which people are thinking about Scotland in a different way is again through poetry. And it's through the romantic poets who, who are coming up to wander in misty, mysterious Highland glens, you know, gasping at sublime vistas and enjoying the picturesque and, and, and writing odes. So we've got uh, William Wordsworth and his sister who, who come up for for a tour. Uh, so would you mind being Dorothy Wordsworth and, and, and reading that extra, <laughs> Arthur? Uh, Dorothy Wordsworth? Yeah. Um, okay. From, no, that's got it. <laughs> no, I'll just read it. Uh, from yeah. the top of the hill, a most impressive scene opened upon our view. A ruined castle on an island, for an island the flood had made it. At some distance from the shore, backed by a cove of the mountain kraken, down which came a foaming stream. The castle occupied every foot of the island that was visible to us, appearing to rise out of the water. Mists rest upon the mountainside with spots of sunshine. There was a mild desolation in the low grounds, a solemn grandeur in the mountains. And the castle was wild, yet stately, not dismantled of turrets, nor the walls broken down, though obviously a ruin. Beautifully, <laughs> beautifully, beautifully read, and you can you can analyze. You, we could spend the next hour or so analyzing that. Mm -hmm. That sums up that romantic view of Scotland absolutely perfectly. You know the ruins. You know the idea of the past. Something has gone. You know, it's Tintern Abbey. You know, did you know, etc. You know the way in which the the landscape is described. That it it's somehow sad. There is something melancholy about it. It's beautiful, but but it's sad at the same time. And this is very much in in, in line with, with with the way that romantic poets and indeed everyone else begins to see Scotland. And it uh, permeates into it, whiskey, you know. And the art as well. You see lots of these yeah, paintings yeah, of yeah. the big mountains, but also the ruins. Scotland. Yeah tastefully deteriorated mm. just kind of like beautifully yeah. crumbled which makes it safe yeah, yeah. you know because the castles aren't occupied you know the, the castles aren't occupied by people who will take up arms and try and overthrow the government you know mm. so you know th there's this really interesting kind of political agenda that, that's kind of simmering away underneath it uh keats one of my favorite poets uh, keats also uh uh journeys up uh and he writes, uh, would you mind being John Keats as well, actually? I can do. Did he have a similar voice to Dorothy Wordsworth? It was slightly lower, I think. Rather. <laughs> <laughs> walking, which one? The bottom, top or yeah, bottom? Yeah, walking, walking in Scotland, yeah. Walking in Scotland. There is a charm in footing slow across a silent plain where patriot battle had been fought, where glory had the game. There is a pleasure on the heath where druids old have been where mantles grey have rustled by and swept the nettled green. 
There is a joy in every spot made known in times of old, new to the feet, although each tale a hundred times be told. Beautiful, Fred. Beautiful. I'm getting into it now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so there you have, you know, you've got everything, everything's there. First verse, you've got druids, you've got mm -hmm. the melancholy uh, vision uh, on the way, you know, the, the idea of walking on other people's footsteps, you know, walking into the past, laments and, you know, fallen heroes. There is no attempt to kind of rekindle the Jacobite flame. Uh, the flame, you know, everything is kind of uh, everything is is as I've said, safe. So by the 1860s, things are beginning to kind of fall into place uh, in terms of whiskey beginning to align itself with, with, with this new imagery, and this I this template that was kind of set up by McPherson, by Scott, by Burke, and those are, those are the foundations. And for me, it kind of Scotland is now in the Highlands of Scotland, especially. There, were, again, we're still really talking about has really been pretty much sanitised. And the next step uh, comes with Queen Victoria. It comes with Queen Victoria and Balmoral and Balmorality, uh, which begins to take off. So here we have uh, some beautiful, beautiful postcard of. Uh, you know, a Gilly, a Gilly Callum uh, is not the name of, of the man. It, Gilly Callum is actually the sword dance. Uh, and he's he's gingerly, uh, you know, uh, yes, he's he, somewhat he's gingerly. Min, he's mincing. He's, he's mincing. Mincing. Yeah, he's, <laughs> mincing, he's mincing with Shirley, uh, as Michael Mather would say. Uh, you know, he, he's, kind, he's kind of mincing uh, over his swords in, in the heather there. I mean, tradition says, uh, this is hilarious, some kind of side issue. But tradition says that the original Gilly Callum uh, was a Celtic prince who uh, was a, had a mortal combat uh, in, in the Battle of Dunsinane with Macbeth in 1054. You know, th this is kind of, uh, but actually, the first record of a sword dance ever being done was in 1801. You know, <laughs> you know it's, a, it's, it's another one of these kind of great, you know, myths and oceanic styles uh, that, that, that's, that's built up. But you begin to you see Queen Victoria coming up, and Victoria and Albert visit Balmoral first in 1848. They buy the castle 1852. They built the new castle in 1856. I've been reading her diaries for another project uh, that, that I've been doing and looking at. She mentions whiskey a lot. She mentions John Begg a lot uh, of Loch Nagar with mm -hmm. extreme fondness. Uh, mm -hmm. It's about you know went in just popped in to see Mrs. Begg. It's kind of like. The neighbours. I popped in to see the neighbours to borrow a cup of sugar. Yeah. It's really, it's really interesting. I think it was a genuine, genuine love of of, of Scotland on, on their part. But at the same time, uh, they did kind of dress up, uh, and there's a lovely, lovely uh, uh, painting of Albert bringing back bringing back the tea uh, to Balmoral. <laughs> really hard deal right now. Why don't you just go and cook it? You know. So there's well, there's three stags there. Uh, you know, Prince Albert in full Highland regalia. There's the Queen, there's princes, there's John Brown but with flaming torches and everything. This is Balmoral, you know, painted by Carl Hag, who did some beautiful studies. He was kind of like the court artist, uh, some beautiful studies of, of, of their, their time of Balmoral. But it was very much hunting, shooting, fishing, wearing, mm -hmm. wearing kilts, wandering around, as the royal family still do, uh, you know, uh, when they're up at Balmoral. Uh, so yeah, and this is really, really, really important. The Highlands had now been tamed. The Highlands had been cleared, but the the fact is, Arthur, that you know at exactly the same time as Prince Albert is is laying three stags at Queen Victoria's feet, you've got potato blight, you've got clearances underway, you've got hardship, you've got poverty, you've got the utter failure of the improvements, you've got the sheep farming failing, you've got the kelp failing, you people leaving the land. All of this is going on. All that kind of other social project is, is underway. In the meantime, all of that, which is the reality of, of the Highlands of Scotland, is being replaced by this fantasy land. Uh, and, you know, as I said, I think, I think I said earlier, th there is more space, you know. You know, the, the, the sheep have cut down a lot or managed to stop forest growing, uh, as of the deer. So... Uh, the views can be even more spectacular. There's no inconvenience of people blocking the view because they're living there, you know. So there's this kind of peculiar disconnect that, that's beginning to happen between the reality of Scotland and people's visions uh, of, of Scotland itself. Can I just interject there slightly? Yeah. Also, with that, I, I wish I thought this before, but I, I saw something go around on Facebook recently about 
the ecological effect of these estates as well. Mm. And there was a list of not just the deer or the grouse or whatever it might be, but all the other animals that were killed, like mm. 20 osprey, mm. um, just every species you could imagine, and some of which are extremely rare or non-existent anymore, in hundreds being killed as well mm. on these estates. And you think of that ecological value now, what, what that would have yeah. to Scotland, and it's heartbreaking list. I'll send it to you afterwards. Yeah, 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 no, and, no please do, please do. And, and finally, also, just briefly worth saying as well that that attachment to Highlandism and the Highland games of Braemar, which the royal family never miss. And I went along there with William Grant, so she kindly invited me. And it is like, um, it's like a Quidditch tournament in this, you know, <laughs> this amazing natural bowl with these incredible, um, uh, you know, mountains all around and these Highland games going on. And this, and th they are still really passionate about that culture whatever you think about it they yeah. are yeah. committed and passionate to it i also that was the second time i went the first time i went was on a unofficial stag do with three australian friends and that was a different experience but anyway <laughs> we didn't fit in we didn't <laughs> fit in um, anyway please carry on yeah yeah so so I mean, it, whiskey then buys into this big stuff you know as soon as whiskey needs to start selling itself this is what this is what it's buying into Everything that we've talked about so far, boom, let, let's move on to some really fun whiskey labels and, and postcards, et cetera, and, and get into the, the absolute meat of it. Uh, so the, here, here are a few of the tropes, you know. So, you know, literary heroes, you know, Ivanhoe from, from Walter Scott, uh, Rabbi Burns. You know, so whiskey is a liquid link to literary heroes, you know, Pure Ivanhoe, you know, the purity is important. Uh, Highlands are important. Fame is important. You know, the, the, there's even the, the language, uh, you know, on these labels. And also, you know, just think about the, the length and, and importance of Burns and Scott, uh, and we tend to look down on them now. But they were incredibly important. But actually, what happened, there was a, a dearth of great writing uh, after both of them died, really up until the beginning of the 20th century, you know, so the project didn't carry on in terms of in terms of a literary uh, point of view, but yeah, maybe talking too much about Scottish literature, there we go. Everything becomes yeah, kind of kooky. Yeah. But, you know, essentially literature, and I will continue with it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> effectively, you know, the literature becomes kind of kooky and sentimentalised and the labels of Scot the Scotch become kooky and sentimentalised at all uh, 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 as well. Uh, so one of the other the, the other images that you see on, on all these kind of earlier uh, labels, wildlife, obviously, because you're shooting it. Uh, so, you know, you've got stags, uh, you know, stags at bay, they're really, really beautiful. And yeah, thanks so much to, to Jim, Jim and Linda Brown, once I, again. Uh, for, I for, love for, that stag. The, the, stag yeah. on ch the challenge whiskey is just beautiful. Yeah. It, it, isn't it just, isn't it just amazing? Uh, yep. No, no, it's fine. No, 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 it's fine. Uh, th then you also, you know, another kind of wild animal uh, in, in, you know, ferocious animal uh, in the Highland wastelands, uh, you know, the healing coo, you know, so, you know, healing coos are, you know, part and parcel of it. Yeah, yeah, I often, often wonder, you know, you know, they kind of look wild and terrifying and kind of hairy, the hairiness of the Highlander is being replaced by the hairiness of the Highlanders, Highlanders cattle. I, I don't know, maybe I'm reading too much into these things. Uh, and then finally, uh, also a wee, a wee dog, the Dandy Dinmont, uh, you know, Scottish Border Terrier. Uh, lovely dog. Uh, please, if you're interested in buying dogs, please buy one of them. It's a, it's a very rare breed these days, very really, really cute little things. Uh, anyway, the Dandy Dinmont. So you've got animals coming in related to Scotland, etc. Uh, and it's a very interesting, I think, also, Arthur, you know, how you, you, you begin to see the way, and, and a lot of these labels are from later in the 19th century, you're, you're beginning to see uh, they're not necessarily all Scottish firms. A lot of them are English bottlers, English English merchants who are using Scottish imagery to, to, to be able to sell it. So it's already in some ways beginning to become slightly divorced <laughs> from, from, from Scotland itself. Uh, but one of the really important uh, elements within, within that kind of 19th century uh, imagery uh, is the role of the military. 
and the role of the military in reimagining Scotland. So you see all there's a load of of, of labels. We're only showing three here, but so many labels. Uh, so praising and and showing the the, the military. You know, uh, the Cameron Highlanders blend. You know, red hackle. You know, uh, of course, uh, the dark eye blend. You know, so, so there there you have high, you know. Uh, Highland heroes, uh, the Highland military in 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 battle, uh, you know, mm. fighting there. It's the really piper, significant. The, the piper there is uh, he, he's effectively bleeding to death, but piping on on the right. Yes. Yeah, you know, as you, as you would, you know. Uh, this is a really significant one, and and this is kind of the culmination of what, what was what happened in uh, what started in the eighteen sixties. The Highland soldier is now. A signifier for Scotland, for strength, for nobility, for courage, and for the British Empire. Mm. You know, so this is not about Scotland anymore. That this is part of the British Empire. So you know, the, the project has shifted completely. Uh, the flip side of that is that one of the reasons for keeping people on the land during improvement was so there were enough young men to be able to uh, man. The landowners' private armies, which were then sent 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 abroad, and one one way of one reason for for getting people to sign up to to join the regiments was to promise them land when they returned from war, if they did return from war, and in the post Napoleonic period, uh, all the, the the victorious Highlanders, you know, coming back from Waterloo, were going back to Tyree, were going back to Sutherland, going back to to all the estates, getting the land, and actually. Increasing that overpopulation, which is already underway, because everybody's living in the, the land which is too poor. Kelp is underway on the Western Isles, so they're allowed to kind of stay on the land. And then as soon as kelp fails and then the potatoes come, uh, all these people who, who've been fighting the wars are kicked off and sent over to Australia or 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 Canada or or, or wherever. So th there's a flip side to, to the whole uh, Highland Hero uh, and hence, hence the sense of betrayal as well. If you, if yeah. your land was taken away from you, but the agreement was you would fight yeah. for, for the yeah. the chief effectively. That, yeah. That is, that, yeah, and and then you know we don't need you anymore. You know you have to buck her off. Uh, yeah. a, a slight risky um, interjection here, um, but I've often found it a bit odd. As an Englishman, live longer in Scotland than anywhere else now. Scottish kids, all that. Um, I could never wear the kilt as an Englishman. That that just ain't right. Um, but also, and it, it's magnificent. They look great at weddings, all my pals. But this sense of Scottish identity, and for some people, this sense of Scot Scottish pride and nationalism, actually permission to wear it, and it's the birth of its popularity comes from the military and fighting mm. for the British Empire. So not, I'm not sure how much that's in people's heads. Uh, um, not at all. Like, well, no. you know, it's a dreadful. <laughs> Nobody thinks about that. Uh, you know, I, I, but I, I don't think it is genuine. You know, it, it's it's one of these it's one of these interesting things. You know, when I've been kind of going through all of this and examining it about how much of, of what we take or take as being Scottish history is in fact completely made up. Mm. <laughs> you know <laughs> the. Uh, you know, the, 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 there is very little truth in there at all. There's a lot of spin going on in the 19th century as to what Scotland should be to, to, to fit into fit into this this kind of project. It sounds like you know, it sounds like a secret society, you know, but it, it's you know, it's not. But you know, the, there is there's definitely an agenda. Uh, there was an agenda certainly with Walter Scott, and I think the way in which Scotland changes over the 19th century and the way in which elements of its history are kind of essentially swept away and swept under the carpet and not really talked about you know it's, and, you know as i said during the clearances one we weren't talk, talked about the clearances at school we weren't talked about you know uh slavery we weren't talking you know talked about any of this you know boom that's not scotland scotland is mountains scotland's guilt scotland is the white heather club etc etc you know it, it was a you know it's a really fascinating area of how you can rebrand a, com uh, a country uh, mm -hmm. in the space of actually a relatively short, pe short period of time. Yeah, uh, it's, and, like, and, and, yeah. it's like an intensity of, uh, an intensifying of identity 
like a concession almost to be mm. part of something bigger, but within within yourself. Yeah. Well, just a quick question, personal one. Where did, when you were when you grew grew up, was it common for Scottish people to wear the kilt to yeah. a wedding? Was that it? Wasn't. Uh, yeah. You. No, my, my dad didn't own a kilt. No, 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 I'm thinking, did anybody wear a kilt, you know, when my cousins and stuff were getting married? No, no. It's kind of, there's been a kind of tartan revival in recent yeah. years. Uh, but no, it wasn't common. I, I wore kilt. I was in, I was in the scouts. I wore kilts in the scouts. Huh. Uh, but uh, that was probably the only time uh, I really wore it. But yeah. mentally, I see it as yeah. something very different from the tartan tourism and the way that tartan is used sometimes to... To be, as a product to be sold, and ultimately, I think it's cool. Like I'm jealous. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I, I, I'm not. You, cool. know, as, you know, I'm, I'm not. I'm not knocking it in any way. But I, I, no, I, I no, do. No. I do think that it's interesting how we have got to the point where we're at now. Really. Yeah. You know, uh, and and part of it, you know, it comes back into this kind of reframing of, of Scotland. You know, the the safe past, but because you got another couple of labels here, uh, which I think are really really illustrative of this, which is now, with all that distance, smuggling is now romantic. You know, the smugglers are romanticised. We still romanticise the smugglers. And don't talk about what under what was underlying the fact that that's why whiskey was being smuggled, that's what people were suffering, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, they are now kind of heroes. They're now noble. Uh, the mountain peak one there, you know, that could be Ossian. I can be Ossian tramping over the heather, you know, you know, and you know, there's the thistle, there's the hills, there's the tartan, uh, there's the bunnet, there's a slightly peculiar way of carrying a cask, you know. The whiskey <laughs> is old, you know. The highlands are old. The man is old. There's a sense of timelessness uh, about all of that. There's a resonance to to all of this, to all of this imagery, you know. It's very, very clever advertising, you know. They, mm. they, and this persisted, you know, these labels are from the beginning of the 20th century. This has become the history, you know, the, that's kind of the point. This has become the history, you know. Uh, that thing which, which was invented, you know, with, with you know, by, you know, with, with King George there, winning his absurd kilt, and Victoria and Albert kind of picking it up. This is now the history, you know, this is what it was all about. And you see mass tourism. Uh, coming up, and the mass Scotch's popularity helps to drive mass tourism. Mass tourism helps to drive Scotch's popularity. You know they're they're, they're interlinked completely. So tourists are arriving to kind of take the air and and take up pursuits. And there's these wonderful kind of uh, tourist guides uh, which are coming out uh, all the way through the 19th century. I've got a couple of examples uh, from slightly later from Edwardian times as well. Uh, here's uh, David McBrain. Uh, running his Royal Mail steamers all across the, the, the Western Isles. Uh, really beautiful. I mean, this is extraordinary. You know, uh, there, there's a steamer going out to St Kilda there. Yeah, so you can get two out to St Kilda. Look at all the routes which are there. Uh, so weekly sailing from Glasgow uh, to Inverness. Uh, uh, th th there's accounts in there, you know, passengers with servants, you know, sh should, you know, please take note. This this is where, you know, this is where and how you should join join the steamers. Uh, and they're all the way through this this guidebook, and there's a lovely uh, tour of Isla that you can do in quite detail. Tour of Isla, you know, what to see in our drishig, etc., etc. All the way through it, it's infested with quotes from Sir Walter Scott. Infested, <laughs> infested with quotes from Walter Scott. And this he is gets everywhere. <laughs> this is over a hundred years later, and that is still there. That is still the fixed image. This is why people are going. You know, you know, the reason that these tourist guides are there is because this is what people want to see. And people are still want to see the sublime. They're still mm. wanting to see those lonely mountains. Uh, it's 150 years since Burke, and everybody's still in the grip of all of this. You know, it's a really odd book to read. You know, it's about monuments. It's about the past. It's, it's about, for me, it's a bit like, like Scotland ceased to exist. And what people are doing is coming up to a movie set. And, mm. and all of this is brigadoon. You know, it doesn't really exist other than for your pleasure. Uh, it, it's, it's a fascinating read. It's a beautiful, beautiful little book. And then, then there's this other one uh, for Badnoch, uh, romantic Badnoch, 
Why are people going to Badenoch? Uh, well, the book says it's because uh, it's a beautiful place to say. Uh, people are really going to Badenoch because it's where McPherson was from. So there's the Ossian link mm. still mm. going on at the beginning of the 20th century. I can't, I can't help. Uh, I can't help noticing, Dave, that apparently Nan is the Brighton of the North. <laughs> I've always thought of it as that. You know, I meant to move to Nan, uh, but uh, the fastest town in Scotland. But uh, but yeah, I failed. Uh, and for us, the climate and surroundings admitted to be unsurpassed in the kingdom. There we go. Yeah. Well done, for us. Mm. Uh, th this is an interesting one as well. You know, it, it's kind of trying to say that we are a destination. We're a tourist destination. You know, we're modern. We're, we're not like. Oh, I get all that kind of romantic stuff. But the whole book is essentially about Bonnie Prince Charlie, uh, Queen Victoria's journals, and Ossian. You know, uh, and there's great uh, adverts in there. You, you learn a lot from from adverts in, the, in these in these documents. Uh, Fraser and Sons. You know, so you can buy your Burberry, uh, bur buy your Burberry jacket in 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 in, in Fraser and Sons of King Yusey. Uh, buy your kilt there if you wish. Buy your Highland jewellery. Uh, by your quake, you know, there's another lovely ad as well, uh, showing that the wares uh, which are available uh, in, in, in King Yusey, you know, quakes, you know, quakes, drinking horns, tar lucky ptarmigan's feet, not lucky for the ptarmigan, but you know, uh, you know, sta stag at bay on top of a rock, uh, you know, the tourist stuff. And I was yeah, thinking, I, you know, th this is this is a look at that, and it, you kind of you laugh at it, and you think. Nothing's changed, you know. Nothing's changed, you know. But you and I will go on holiday and we'll we'll buy tourist stuff. Yeah, you know. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, and, and are these guides any any worse than TripAdvisor? I think they're better than TripAdvisor, to be perfectly honest. And yeah. I don't think any of it was harmful, to be perfectly honest. Uh, yeah. I think by this point things had changed. Yeah. I know I can't have, again. I notice here that you at the bottom there you can buy a real Scotch pebble specimen for is that fifteen shillings? Fifth, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, it's expensive. You know, not, there's not many pebbles in Scotland. You know? <laughs> no, it's, it seems like a lot. But then there's a premium, seventeen shillings and six, I think, for a, a real Cairngorm specimen. Ah, uh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, well, the Cairngorm is a semi-precious stone, so it was yeah. very, very popular uh, in those days. But you know. Uh, beautiful. Can you see in Pitlochry? I, I don't know if they're still there in Pitlochry. Maybe it's something you could branch out to with drink hunger, you know. If we can sell pebbles for, for good money, <laughs> that 15 well, shillings, know. I'm sure someone will look up what 15 shillings is in today's money for a pebble. <laughs> probably, you probably sell these bloody whiskey stones, you know, it's effectively the same thing. You know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, so all of this has again, has an effect on the imagery. So the tourism then feeds into the labelling, uh, the way in which uh, Scotch whisky is sold. Because whisky now is fixed within this romantic landscape. So you're seeing lots of labels with locks and glens. <laughs> Good God. Boom. You know, you know, look at that. You know, <laughs> it, could, it could essentially be the same place. You know? you know, as long as you've got some water, hills, a few trees, some heather, boom, uh, you're soft. And maybe the odd thistle, you're fine. That is what Scotland is. Uh, that's a relively modern Glengoyne uh, label. Just thought I'd throw that one in. Uh, yeah, I, I kind of hit it. I was going to play a spot the spot the um, yeah. spot the difference. And actually, a note on dating some of these labels. I've I apologise. I put dates on some of them. It's terribly difficult. I've put early twentieth century. Sometimes it is it's late. It, it it's um. It's late 19th. It's very, very difficult. So take them with yeah. a pinch of salt, but that's amazing. And if you don't mind, Dave, tiny little pause for beauty. I just wanted to, because some of the design and the draftsmanship, I've just zoomed in on a couple of those. I mean, beautifully done. It's oh. just so no, They're stunning. They're stunning. They're, the they're, they're beautiful and... pieces of art. You know, they're, they're just, they're great. I mean, it's why, we, it's why we love these things. You know, they, they are, they are beautiful. They, they tell a story. You know, they, they don't, they probably don't really tell a story about the whiskey, but they, they, they kind of they tell a deeper story. You know, once you begin to look at why all these labels appeared, why they all looked very, very similar to it, it's because of this kind of backstory. But the way in which it was done is just stunning. You know, absolutely yeah. stunning. Yeah, and I, I banned myself when I was prepping these slides from looking into any of these names. You know, like P and J McNabb. There is just one of them, a candle maker row. But you get, as you say, people in 
little little companies in Liverpool mm. or London or Dundee or wherever, and they've all got their own little blend. And yeah. we we kind of those stories are never told. And if you go through some of these old label books, it, it, it's it's almost sad to think of all these yeah. little dreams that just turned to nothing. But yeah. they yeah. they created them with such care. Mm. Where did they go? And mm. and the important thing and who is drinking them? Because they wouldn't these wouldn't have appeared. You wouldn't get this great kind of great plethora of all these different labels all picking up different parts of Scottishness or this what had become Scottishness. Uh if there wasn't demand. And the next kind of couple of sets could begin to give an idea of how whiskey had shifted from you know in, in terms of who was drinking it, when they were drinking it, and how they were drinking it. Mm. Because you get a whole set of, of labels uh, of people relaxing in a kilt, <clears throat> you know, and the, the relaxing in the kilt thing becomes a great. I mean, we've only got three here, but the, there's there are loads more, you know. But, you know, one on the left here, you know, with, with his faithful hound, you know, raising the glass. Uh, a couple of chaps there having a little relaxed dram. Uh, well, three chaps there, uh, at Glen Otter, uh, and then another faithful hound shepherd, you know, after a, a long a long tramp. Uh, there's no sheep, so obviously you know, Lassie has lost the sheep, uh, and there he is with, with his drinking horn and you know, the purple, the purple-headed mountain uh, behind. Uh, and you know, are these Scottish people? Some of them are, some of them aren't. Are they chiefs? Not really. Are they soldiers? They're not. They're middle-class gents quite often. Certainly, that one in the middle, the Glen Otter one, is really interesting. They're mm. middle-class gentlemen, you know. You know, Prince Albert wore a kilt, you know, when he went up to Scotland. They are relaxing. They're not military. They're not marching. They're not mincing through the heather, dancing. There is something slightly louche about that that one in the middle as well. You know, yeah. that there's there's evidence that whiskey's becoming this acceptable drink for gentlemen. Yeah. You know, and because of that, the way it's sold is 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 changing and reflecting who is buying it. So the labels are reflecting the the, the, the consumer. It's really interesting. You don't see that these days uh, at all. You know, and they're not bottles for Scotland. You know, these are aimed at export. These are aimed at England. I, I would say to help perpetuate this idea or build on this idea of this this weird fantasy land uh, that, that that lies in the north. You know, it is a caricature. It's it's invented. The kilt is fancy dress this is theater <laughs> that, we're, that we're dealing with here i know that he's drinking he's the glen Otter chap is very satisfied with himself he's drinking the oldest purest and best <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah, god god bless you moss and potter of thetford you know and yeah. briefly because you know the time's going yeah. on and i'm yeah. sorry i'm not getting i can see the comments just rattling past but um, I, i'm not going to get time to bring too many up on screen but um do you think these people drinking them, they're fantasizing about Scotland because there's this idea of purity of place kind of beyond the wall? You know, you've had industrialization, the world's changed so much, and, and there's a simplicity scene to you know, this this land up in Scotland, a yeah. purity to it. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, mm. absolutely. You know, it is the other, you know, it, it's this it's this place of open spaces where you can relax, you know, and and you know, you, you still see that, you know, in, in in the west of Scotland, you know, you know, people moving to the west of Scotland because it's quiet, you yeah. know, and then kind of stopping people investing. Anyway, uh, so, 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 so here we have, you know, more, you know, relaxing with a dram, you know, and, and a picnic, you know, <laughs> solitary picnic. Mm. Oh, no, well, no, 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 no. I, mean, I love the story. This is one of my favourites yeah. ever, the, yeah. the story behind it, the, the guys looking for the lost chap with who's got the picnic with the whiskey yes. and they're searching around for him scotch the scotch yeah. mist yeah, just beautifully mist. drawn yeah. yeah and mckinley i mean mckinley's used this this type of imagery for <clears throat> probably longer than <clears throat> pardon me uh any other uh, any other whiskey company actually uh mm. and then yeah I, i'm also aware of, of of the time here so it kind of rattle through the, the next few oh. because uh Fantastic. you begin you, you begin to see uh you know, sporting pursuits, you know, the sheep failed. One, you know, and one reason that the deer fox came in was because the, the, the sheep, the, the grand sheep runs, simply didn't work. Uh, so in come the deer forest, in comes deer stalking. This starts in 1784. A man called Colonel Thomas Thornton 
who was a wealthy Yorkshire landowner, and he essentially attacked all the fauna of Speyside with a military campaign, uh, bringing, a, a, a quote from, from the account here, uh, two uh, baggage wagons in a seagoing sloop, and the equipment included boats, fishing tackle, guns, ammunition, hawks, horses, dogs, furniture, hay and corn, materials for stables and gardens, and a gargantuan quantity of provisions for himself, his retinue, and his numerous guests. <laughs> and, and, and he wrote a book about it. And people began to become interested in it. And then Scrope, William Scrope, who had stopped at Brewer Lodge on the Athol Estate in the 1820s. 1838, he publishes The Art of Deer Stocking, and it goes ballistic, <laughs> literally. Uh, and it becomes incredibly popular. Uh, and it's what the landed gentry do. They go to Scotland and begin to shoot things. And really all the way up to the First World War, you know, this is what to do. And these are amazing uh, images here on, on these labels. You know, the one on the left, you know, you have the sports of two sportsmen there uh, dressed, you know, I think they're meant to be wearing tweed, but it looks like they're wearing kind of solar topies, you know, like they should be in the in the jungle. You know, passing mm -hmm. it around to the faithful gilly there with a, with a stag on the back of the pony. Uh, and then the one on the right, and you look at that, and you, you think you cast your mind back to to uh, Queen Victoria's dinner being thrown on, on the doorstep of Balmoral. It's essentially the same picture, you know. Uh, and you you know we haven't shown Lancia, we haven't shown any of the Lancia stuff, but you know the same images appear and reappear, and and large grand paintings are reinterpreted a lot in, in, into these labels. Uh, I, I thought these, these two. Really yeah, yeah, absolutely. I thought these two were interesting. Um, firstly, a, a lady on the right. That is not mm. often in, in a lot of this imagery. Queen Victoria's yeah. side. Yeah. Um, r rarely, rarely seen. Women don't seem to Pretty play sure. a part of this um, Highland imagery. And the chap in the left-hand label, but standing on the right, he it comes back to what you said. He ain't Scottish. Yeah. Um, no, he is, you know, you could substitute a modern Russian or a modern, you know, someone else who comes up to Scotland yeah. now to, 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 shoot to, shoot, to shoot things, yeah. yeah. Yep. And then you have Ben Kruken again, you know, boom, we're back. Mm. We're back towards the spot, you know. Uh, so, yeah, so, so the brands, obviously, you know, the, the major brands are, are picking up on this as well. So, you know, Dewar's uh, ran very successful campaign, you know, the, the first moving picture advert, advert about, you know, the, the whiskey of his forefathers, you know, and the classic there, you know, you've got military, you've got ancient, uh, uh, ancient Scot, you've got potential Jacobite, and you've got the modern, the modern laird or gentleman relaxing with the dram, uh, kind of cartoony thing about the, about the Highland game. And on the right hand side there, I, I think I, I can sentimentalise portrait of a Jacobite chief in there. It could be Bonnie Prince Charlie himself. You know everything. Everything has become sentimentalised, uh, and the past is being plundered uh, to to help promote this idea of Scotland. So Scotch whisky and Scotland become inextricably bound up. The imagery about both of them, boom, absolutely welded together at, at this point. And yeah, I mean, here's Dewar's. Uh, and you know, as uh, the one in the middle, you, uh, tell us about the one one in the middle here. Yeah. So when when you passed over the images for prepping up the slides, I kind of spotted. Well, actually, I, I, this whiskey of his forefathers with with um, the, the ancients coming out of the paintings is great. A really, really great uh, idea. But so your playing cards, they're yours, aren't they? You're, you're putting them yeah. as mid twentieth century. Uh, um, yeah, 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 yeah. Early to mid, yeah. So I had this advert from in, I think it was in the Sphere in January 1897. So slightly different rendition of it, but um, but the same idea fully 50 years later, maybe 60 years later, they're still using that. Although I've got another couple of things I wanted to show you as well. Yeah, sure. Jewers didn't just do that, but they did a lot of this. <laughs> they did a lot of this Highlandism stuff. I'll show them later. Sure. I'll come oh, back yeah, 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 because yeah, for me it's really interesting to compare that kind of the festooning of <laughs> of labels and advertising with with, with tartan and, and uh, all of the imagery that we've kind of discussed there with, say, Johnny Walker, 
You know, your journey worker mm. does not follow that path. You know, journey worker is completely different. You know, there's no Highland hero in, in Walker. You know, the, the striding man for me is really camp. You know, the, there's a there's a really kind of camp attitude to to you know, there's a PhD in that. Uh, I I think, but you know, the thing about the striding man, he, he's kind of kind of contemporary, but he's put in contemporary settings, but he's somehow distant, and he's kind of stateless at the same time. And and it's about him. I think it's not a bad thing if you're going to be a global brand in some mm. ways. You, know, you either go, yes, we are identifiably Scottish and we're going to go down that route, or we're kind of, we're every man and we're kind of some, but also we're someone that you don't know, you know. So the only kind of sop to the kind of Scottish trend in terms of Walker was, a, I would say, the use of, of terminology like Old Highland. You know, on, on the labels, you know, that idea of the Highlands, that idea of, of the ancient uh, coming through. But, you know, Walker's a really interesting one. Walker's a very sophisticated, very kind of global campaign. Essentially, as soon as that striding man begins begins to walk, he's off, you know, and associations with Scotland are stretched, perhaps. Mm -hmm. But I suppose that the, 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 the the world's association of Scotland and Scotch whiskey, they don't need to do it. And they've I really admire that Johnny Walker advertising. We don't yeah. have much of it, but that long, that bold bravery to just go with that simple label looks a bit different and, and, and to know what they stand for simplicity and class and not this Scottishness. And, 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 and um, yeah, it's, it's to be admired. I will just show yeah. those things I want to show because what you see with, I found in contrast to Johnny Walker, sorry, in, um, yes, in contrast to Johnny Walker, you see some other major brands kind of doing both. Like I mentioned Jewers, we've seen a lot of those Jewers. They also do something like this, a very similar time. That's Beautiful. Awesome. Yeah, it's oh, it's uh, amazing. Really sophisticated, emotional, but with a really simple image, a whiskey of high repute. Brilliant. But yeah. in not quite the same paper, or even sometimes the same paper, they'll have that image, that portrait of a Highland lead um, right next door to it. So they're, they're kind of almost splurge gunning, lots and mm. lots of different imagery, which is really odd to see if you if you watch modern marketing now where they kind of zero in on a vision and they go down that path for a long time and then someone else comes in maybe and then they have a turn but they're doing one week it's this and one week it's that and one week it's that so here's a really good example of this Buchanan's black and white whiskey and people will be used to the dogs the little black and white dogs they do but wow. here's a name yeah here's a naval officer 1909 on the bridge um uh yeah drinking black and white but then what's that that's november 1909 but then another advert i had december 1910 but <laughs> they probably ran pretty, ran pretty concurrently and the actual is cut off it was too big for my scanner but the the caption is to the king but yet the king is that's jacobite. Well, yeah. yeah that's jacobite so you've got on the one hand you've got the british navy and then running concurrently You've got to the king, the Jacobites, Body Prince Charlie. I mean, it's 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 really strange. Um, the, 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 there's rich imagery to, to 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 draw from, and you know, and again, I mean, I'm not criticising this. You know, if you if you're selling a product around the world to people who haven't heard of it before, you're going to have to use shorthand in some way. You know, mm. and, and the shorthand is hills, hills, glens, shooting things, military, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know. You know, it's everything is is reduced to its essence because it's got to be in an ad, got to be on, uh, uh, you know, you know, easily identifiable as being as being Scotland. Uh, but given you know, the sophistication of those, uh, shows that there is there is in fact a, a, a different way forward. But I'm not convinced really that that many firms picked up on it. Uh, you know, uh, the, some of the big brands really did, uh, but the majority of people, I think, kind of stuck with that sentimentalized kind of cliche ridden uh, way of trying to sell it you know in, in the same way as kind of rum was sold by pirates you know pirates would you know bugger all to do with rum you know scotch had scotch had all of this uh and and so so, so we kind of move into this kind of sentimentalized area uh of you know a lovely, lovely kind of postcard here as well you know, uh, uh, no, oh, no sorry, 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 more playing cards. You know, again, it's got the examples of you know the classic tropes of gents and 
kindly gentlemen and, and warriors. Uh, and then the, this kind of Harry Lauder, Hilliard <laughs> School, whimsical, sentimentalised, coothy, uh, as we say, view of Scotland. Old Angus, you know, old Angus there, you know, cradling a lamb, you know. Uh, <laughs> gentle as a lamb is old Angus, you know. Classic example of, of the sentimentalised view uh, that began to become uh, the norm uh, at the beginning of the 20th century with, with music hall, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and also the return of Sony, you know, because people get bored with it. You know, there's now a new way of, of, of looking at, 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 at Scots, you know, which is the old way of looking at Scots, uh, the drunken Scotsman, uh, you know, standing there, not the huge Highland hero, but, you know, the tartan trues, the bottle of whiskey and the the bonnet uh, on the head. Uh, and then you've got the mean Scotsman uh, as well. Uh, you know, I was surprised he actually gave you some money. Uh, you know, a beautiful, beautiful postcard. I mean, the, the, yeah. the, you know, the, the art, that's incredibly beautiful. You know, but yeah, the, the, the mean Scotsman uh, as a trope. And I think we've got another couple of examples coming up. You know, the Scotsman's prayer because no treating means you're not allowed to buy a round. Uh, so, you know, there he is praying because, you know, nobody's buying him around. He's not going to put his hand in his pocket. Uh, then, you know, the drunken Scotsman feeling rather seasick on, on, a, on a ferry. Somebody looks a little bit like Will Fife, uh, you know, gazing at him. You know, so suddenly you've got the comic Scotsman appearing. You know, and he's always uh, tartan clad and he's always, you know, got the bonnet on. And it's almost as if there's this reaction to this kind of coothiness and this high Victorian view of, of Scotland that stags at bay and, uh, and everything. Uh, and it becomes more earthy again. Uh, and things change fundamentally. Uh, I, you know, and that, and that one on the left, you know, that's essentially, you know, we're right back to, you know, that 18th century view of, of, of Sonny, you know, skinny legs, uh, very short kilt, big bonnet greeting because the bottle of whiskey's broken. Uh, you know, glasses are empty, I'm out of spirits, you know, uh, drunkenness, uh, you know, it's, that is what, that becomes the kind of Scottish stereotype. Uh, you know, <laughs> you know, I, you know, I, I, I'm not offended by this, you know, I, you know, geez, you know, the, the worst, worst things have been drawn. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it, it's just a fact, you know, that the, the, the way in which whiskey, but it's not, actually not the way that whiskey is, it's the way in which Whiskey plus Scotsman equals drunkenness. Whiskey on its own is actually quite sophisticated. As soon as a Scotsman gets involved in it, it suddenly becomes this disreputable drink. So if as long as you keep whiskey away from Scottish people, it will be fun. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know there, there's this, you know, you don't see uh, English people or Americans carousing with, with, with bottles of whiskey in this particular way. You know, you only see Scotsmen who clearly can't take their drink and are too fond of their drink. So it's a really interesting little kind of twist that that, that, that happens uh, all the way through the 20th century. <laughs> That's a really interesting point, actually. And I, I, I didn't, I didn't scan any or prep any of them. But also contemporaneous, you've got the Dewar's ads with, uh, and probably Johnny Walker as well with um, gentlemen in gentlemen clubs, Edwardian English gentlemen mm. in the London clubs calling for Jewers or Johnny Walker yeah. or whatever it might be. But it, I mean, that's, yeah, yeah s similar timing. And I, 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 I've owned that postcard for ages. I only, <laughs> only when I've blown up big have I noticed that not only is the policeman wearing a kilt, he's also <laughs> wearing a tartan helmet. <laughs> I've never seen a policeman in a tartan helmet, but <laughs> we, we, stopped, we stopped just short of doing that with the Scottish Tourism Board. Um, <laughs> But also, actually, in other postcards that I've got from around the world, you do see tropes of, uh, like in Germany, you see a, a real common trope, and I hope we do an episode of that. I need to get some postcards translated, but of drunk Germans, and they tend to be big, fat men, bald men who've drunk too much beer. And the, cap the postcard artists draw them in this similar, instantly recognisable style. So you see that. And in America, you see drunk rye drinkers in kind of 
uh, check trousers. And, and in France, you see a similar style of how you draw a drunk person. Mm. And for some reason in England, it's, it's a Scottish person. It's a Scot <laughs> yeah, it's a Scotsman yeah. or, yeah, it, it, essentially it's a Scotsman. You know, uh, yeah, it, it's a fascinating shift that takes place here. Whiskey's all right. You know, it's all right for, it's all right for us, drinking whiskey and soda, yeah. but, you know, keep it away from the Scots. <laughs> yeah, I, I say for some reason, we can probably say that's prejudice or, and yeah. something. Yeah, right. I, I don't want to get into that, Arthur. Yeah, no, <laughs> let's say. Yeah, I think we probably can. Yeah. Um, and, and, and then, you know, the, all the way through, it, then you, you begin to get kind of seaside postcards of, of your kilt, you know, of, of women looking up, up men's kilts, uh, yeah. which happens on a regular basis. You know? It does. Uh, it must be very frustrating. Postcards. postcards, anyway. Yeah. I, I haven't got that up your kilt postcard loaded. I do beg your pardon. I oh. do have this one, which I think is a nice little summary one as well. Oh, from 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 the left to the right. So that is the cock of the north on the left, the Duke of Gordon. You know, graceful, elegant, you know, majestic. Majestic, and, I would say. And now look how it's been traduced, you know, <laughs> the, the, the noble Duke of Gordon, you know, uh, brought down into, once again, we have Sony, you know. So it's kind of, essentially it's kind of gone, it's kind of gone, gone full circle. But, you know, Tartan, you know, it's like you were saying earlier, you know, it's Tartan's come back. You know, and Tartan's kind of got this, it's still an identifier, it's still a signifier uh, for Scotland, you know, and, you know, and it's interesting the way in which it's used, you know, in the days when there were such things as whiskey shows around the world. It was, you know, I, I remember, all, you know, going to whiskey shows and seeing Japan, you know, and, and everybody would be seeing the same hotel, and, you know, in the morning of the show, you hear the clack of brogues and everybody would walk down, everybody would be in the kilt. They were there and everything. And somehow, you know, I don't know, 2005, 2010, maybe, people began going, I can't be bothered around the kilt anymore. And it began to kind of slowly disappear. And the only people you really see wearing kilts, I found uh, in my admittedly limited experience in recent years of international whiskey shows, are Dutch. The Dutch wear a lot. They're, they're big on the kilt. Uh, Germans are big on the kilt. And, uh, you know, people will accuse you, you know, because you're Scottish, saying, why are you not wearing a kilt? You know, well, don't have to. Uh, but, you know, so it's still, there's still that thing uh, in there that, you know, you're going to have a whiskey evening. Oh, fine. Yeah, you, you all have to. There has to be tartan involved somehow. So it has continued on. And the way in which tartan is being used and the kilts are being used, not all of that old imagery. I think in Scotland, I think there's conceivably a new pride, but there's also kind of postmodern irony uh, to the whole thing. You know, the, the, the tartan kilt and the CU Jimmy hat is essentially taking that Sony and turning it on, turning it on its head, going, you can't really laugh at me because I can laugh at myself. You know, it's, it, it's really interesting the, the way in which it's done. But the thing that fascinates me about whiskey, uh, you know, kind of, kind of, really wrapping things up here is that it's still accusing you know you still see new marketing ideas coming up and new kind of pr firms going you know oh or, or you know, it's not the pr firms they're the top of the clients their clients kind of going oh you know scott you know it's scotch is tired and it's old-fashioned and it's all about hills and glens and tartan and all of that no whiskey firm has used that imagery for decades mm -hmm. but somehow True. Somehow, in people's minds, that is what Scotch whiskey represents. Uh, and for me, that's something that either needs to be embraced, and the reality of Scotland needs to be embraced in a new creative way, and you can use it in a new creative way. But, you know, I think there, there's a need to kind of really move advertising and imagery forward in the way that you saw that taking place in these amazing ads he had from Jeers and Buchanan's, you know, these innovative, clever and clever adverts which are being used. And talking about place in, in, in a different way, you know, talking about a real Scotland in a different way. Yeah, well, as a retailer, um, 20 years ago, I joined the industry and, you know, I would say probably a third of the bottles had an element. One of these things we're talking about, either tartan, a landscape, um, uh, you know, a Highlander or something like that, particularly in some of the old, the old blends. There's almost none now, almost none. Mm. Um, just little flashes here and there, or this, that, 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 the other. And actually, 
I, you know, it would probably sell quite well if if some people bought that back in a bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you probably and you get some of these faux whiskies over in India as well, bagpiper and, and things like that that do very very well yeah. that show that that show that popularity of this yeah. set of imagery. Mm -hmm. But you know, but basically, you know, the, 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 that that's that's where we are. You know, the the, <clears throat> the way in which Scotland and improvements and romanticism, Queen Victoria, this total shift in the way in which an entire country what was viewed, feeds into whiskey, and as whiskey begins to spread around the world, it takes that imagery with it. In fact, I I, I would argue it almost drives the imagery uh, towards the tail end of the. 19th and beginning of the 20th century. And again, not saying it was right, not saying it was wrong. That is simply what happened. But that is how whiskey became popular and how, yeah, how it became part and parcel of that, that imagery of, of an entire country. Mm. And I suppose one other final point I just jotted down that, that, that triggered in me and how you experience it as a tourist or, or just a visitor. I mean, I live, I live south of Edinburgh, but I love to go up to the highlands or the islands. And you do go there to experience these landscapes. Whereas I grew up in the south, and Cornwall's a wee bit different. You go to see the beaches. But elsewhere in England, you go to see these communities, these villages that have been preserved and are absolutely beautiful. You know, just you drive through some of these little Cotswold villages. And it's, it, it's just, so, you know, sometimes a bit twee, but it's just so beautiful. We don't really have that in Scotland. Once you go above a certain point, you know, a, a, a lot of the towns are feel quite empty. They're not beautiful to look at and, and the little villages because they were largely emptied and there wasn't continuous occupation. It's a very, very different way of experiencing yeah. the country. There's another episode. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, there, we, there we have it. It's brilliant. And I just want to do one PS because... Uh, the order of the slides didn't quite work, and we could. You, you jumped on a bit. I couldn't show just one of the one really beautiful oh, image. Yeah. Uh, like, just for the pleasure of it, going back to Sawney. Look at that! Isn't that just amazing artistry? And I even just zoomed in on some of the detail of it. That penmanship. Yeah, gorgeous. Absolutely. And, and John Bull looking a hell of a lot like Doctor Johnson. You know. It's, yeah. Uh, <laughs> True. You know, it, it, it's yeah. Great, a great, great piece of work. So I'm, I'm the just, guy, I'm the guy I'm on gonna... the right. I'm the guy on the right, am I, Dave? Yeah, you're, yeah. you're the one on the left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm the, I'm the mean, the, the mean spirited one on the, on the left. That's it. Uh, I, I just noticed that young Joe McCarker is on as usual. Happy birthday, Joe! Yes, happy Sign birthday, Joe! Significant birthday, significant. So it's one again. Yeah, congratulations. And and I think there was one last slide that you wanted to show that yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just, you know, uh, just because I like seeing, you know, Ronnie Cox. Uh, yeah, you know, on, on the right hand side, there, there you have, you know, a, a classic kind of modern take on where we're having <laughs> we're having a whiskey event. I think it's to do with Daimler, uh, you know, it was kilts being worn in interesting fashion. Uh, but, you know, that's what Scotland is, you know, and, and it's, it's a bit fun. And there, there you have the keepers of the quake, which, on one, on one side is, if you look at it in the wrong way, it's all about the Victorian thing. It's baronial, and there's there's antlers everywhere, and there's everybody wearing tartan, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there is, there's a wit about it. That there's there's a kind of knowing wink that this is somehow fantastical, but at the same time it is beautiful. So it's oh. almost like it's almost like reclaiming that cliche and going, yes, we understand it. Like you know, it, it, it's a high class way of you know, high class. See you, Jimmy Hat. Kind of. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Annabelle. But you know, it is not. I, I remember speak, speaking to Lord Elgin about it. You know, Lord Elgin w w w was given the proposal for the keepers of the quake, uh, and he looked at it uh, oh. and he went, "I can't be part of this." Unless it's more fun, it's not. It's not ridiculous enough, <laughs> you know. So let's dial it up a bit, and, and it's dialed up to the max, and it's an extraordinary, extraordinary event. Uh, so on the face of it, it looks like you know something out of Balmoral, and at the same time, I, I do think there's there, there's a wonderful 
sense of humor uh, and, and generosity uh, about the imagery surrounding it. It's it's beautiful. It is, and for people that don't know, we should maybe explain. The Keepers of the Quake is an industry organisation. You're invited into it as a as a thank you for service to the whiskey trade after a certain period of time. I'm a keeper. You're probably a master, aren't you, Dave? I'm a master. Yeah. Doff my bonnet. And they have two dinners, uh, two dinners a year, and many amazing people from the industry are there. But it's the only it, it, it's. <laughs> It's the only experience I've had of a full dinner where everything is done beautifully to the maximum with pipers in an amazing room in, in, in Blair Castle, everyone looking incredible, a ridiculously big quake. Um, and it's it's a beautiful, beautiful sight as well. Yep. So it works. So you, you can do it. Yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. Dave, thank you. That was that was really amazing. Thank you. Um, it was probably the longest episode. Right? I thought it was going to be the shortest. So, uh, <laughs> thank, well, thank, thank you for your patience, viewers. Yeah. The, there was a lot we left out as well. Burns barely got mentioned. One label. Um, that was all. Um, but uh, fascinating. Uh, so, before we run credits, I think we, you and I need to have a little chat about what happens next. We're entering the new kind of phase after this Ooh. lockdown. Hopefully, oh. the next. Um, we'll probably make an announcement uh, towards the end of the month about what's happening next, but we'd like it to continue. There seems to be this amazing little community of dusties, of people who appreciate these old mottled pieces of paper and dog-eared <laughs> I thought you were talking about me for a second there. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but actually, you know, it, I, I'm sure we'll be able to come up with new subjects. We've got a big short list and, uh, and finding the time and the way to do it uh, when there are pubs to go to, as we've already mentioned, to the Independent Whiskey Bars of Scotland. Um, oh, it's gone. Yeah, gigs to go to, hopefully, all that kind of thing. Uh, but uh, we've really enjoyed it. And, and the community and the people commenting and the people sharing and the people saying they enjoy it has meant a tremendous amount. And actually, it's been a huge incentive, hasn't it, to dive deeper than yeah. uh, we ever thought we would into these incredibly dusty, dry wormholes. So, so please t tell your friends. Yeah. And uh, I think we'll be back in May, won't we, Dave? Why not? Yeah. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Cheers, Dave. Cheers, everyone. Uh, good night, everyone. Happy birthday, Joe. Happy birthday, Joe.